Welcome to Student Affairs Live. I'm your host, Tony Duty, and I'm pleased to be joining you from my professional home at Rutgers University. We broadcast on the Higher Ed Live Network, and you can tune in to Student Affairs Live along with my talented friend and colleague, Heather Shea Gasser, Wednesdays this summer at 1 o'clock Eastern Time. Be sure to stay with us till the end of the show to hear about the great lineup we have scheduled for the next few months. In a moment, I'll introduce you to our distinguished guest, but we can't do that without first giving a shout out to the sponsors that make Student Affairs Live possible. Higher Ed Live is sponsored and produced by M. Stoner, a marketing communications firm that works with education institutions on branding, strategy, web design, and more. Student Affairs Live is also sponsored by ACPA, College Student Educators International. ACPA's strategic partnership with Higher Ed Live calls attention to the pairing of innovative professional development delivery with the strength of a renowned professional association. ACPA publishes the Journal of College Student Development and About Campus. Now, I want to give a special shout out and thanks to Laura Pasquini from University of North Texas for monitoring today's back channel and taking questions from the Twitterverse. I also want to thank my colleague Julie Traxler, who is the Assistant Dean of Academic Services here at Rutgers for helping me refine and develop some of the questions for today's show. Finally, I'm pleased to have joined me today someone well-known and adored in the field of academic advising, Charlie Nutt. Charlie, welcome to today's show. Thank you. Thank you so much. If, if I don't know the answer to a question, Julie, I will call on you to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Charlie, can you start us off by sharing your role, how many years you've been in that role, and one thing that you would change about higher education if you could and why? Okay. Um, I'm executive director of NACADA, and I've been here since 2002. Um, executive director since 2007. Prior to that, I spent my entire life in Georgia. This is obviously not a Kansas accent. Um, as a, a K through 12 teacher, college English teacher, and, and administrator before coming to NACADA. Within that, so probably the major thing I would change about higher ed, if I could, if I had the magic wand, they could do that would be to, to open up the lines of communication across the universities, across colleges, but also down from the top down and from the bottom up. Um, because right now in higher ed, it's, I think a lot of what we deal with is just lack of communication and lack of knowledge of what's going on in the different areas on campus so that many times we, we have repetition of things occurring instead of coming together to work as a team within that. So I would I would take my magic wand and open up the lights of communication and tear down the, the walls across campuses. Nice. So so Charlie, I saw in a recent keynote address that I checked out on YouTube, you compare advising to a GPS, a global positioning system device. We actually use that to help advertise the show here today. Can you explain that metaphor to our audience? Absolutely. Um, first of all, the, the, the GPS system itself would be whatever technology system you might be using, which provides you more of the opportunity to meet with the students because you've got a system that, used, that does a lot of what you used to do, which might be course selection or those type of avenues within that. Um, but it really is the idea that that in order for a student to be successful, they've got to know where they're going. Um, I, I, people who've heard me speak know that I've used the line, it, you, we tend to treat it as if it's a, a treasure hunt. You find, find all the clues, you don't get kicked off the island, then you'll be, you'll be allowed to graduate. And we should, we should make a pathway. And a pathway that is that we talk about why you're on it, why, what is the best reason why do you go this way? But also the whole idea of, of helping students to recalculate. You know, if you get lost on GPS, the lady doesn't scream at you that you're lost. She simply says recalculating. So as advisors, we need to help students to recalculate as they move forward. It may be that that's not the pathway they thought they really wanted to do, or it may be that things in their lives occur and they have to make changes, whatever the case may be. But as advisors, we're helping students to map that pathway. We calculate where they need to, but to really think about what those pathways are and why they're on that highway. Many times, students have no idea why they're on the highway they're on, except 
they they wanted to come to college, or someone told them they were, they were going to come to college, whatever the case may be. I love it. I love that metaphor. I'm going to, I'm going to use that. I'm not going to borrow that from you. So there are... Thank you. So, so you know, in researching this, there, there are just so many approaches and, and models to advising. What are some of the models that have emerged recently? You know, as I, as I thought about this question, to, Tony, I really thought about an article that Marsha Miller and Maura Reynolds wrote. Marsha's head of the executive office, and Maura Reynolds was at Hope University, Hope College, for many years. And it really talked, to, they really brought it down to, you know, the models and what you call them are not what's important. What's really important are the four questions you need to think about. What, who is being advised? You know, we're talking about advising freshmen. We talk about advising students who've been accepted into a business program. You know, who is who is being advised? And then who's doing the advising, whether it be professional, whether it be faculty, whatever the case may be. Um, where is it being done? I know many times location is an issue for a first generation, first time student, whereas it might not be for a, a senior, but then again, it would be very much an issue for a transfer student who knows nothing about Rutgers and comes into your campus and is totally lost as a, as a junior many times within that. And then how are we going to divide those advising responsibilities? I think if we look at those four questions, then we can begin to think about are we going to have a centralized model or a decentralized model? Is it going to be faculty-based? Is it going to be professional-based? Is it going to be a collaborative approach? You look at those four questions, it begins to help you decide what is that model that's best for our campus and for our students. You know, there is not a best model. Uh, the model is what works for your campus. And I think that's one of the reasons I, I don't like the term best practices because it might be best at Rutgers, but it's going to suck at K-State. And so how do you make it work within that? And so I think that becomes a, a really important factor that we have to think about as we look at the models, that there's not one. Um, I think if we um, think about who our students are and what they need, we begin to identify what we need to work with them on. The same with approaches. Um, you know, we hear about... Um, developmental advising and intrusive and intentional advising, appreciative advising, whatever the case may be, it's they're all methods of reaching out to students. And just like in the classroom, we have different teaching strategies for the way students learn. We have different advising approaches for the way students learn. So what works for you might not work for the student who comes in after you which is why advisors have to know about all of these approaches so they can understand what works and what doesn't work because it is so much of the teaching learning paradigm that that can be advised it's based upon. Nice. So, so no, no one size fits all. I, I get it. So the, the title of today's show is Trends in Academic Advising. So what are some of the trends that you're paying close attention to this year? I'm going to go ahead and say up front, guys, I, I made some notes. So I'm not reading from a piece of paper, but I do have notes. Um, I think, of course, one of the biggest pieces is the use of analytics. And I know we're going to talk about that a little bit later as well. But how institutions, you know, analytics is the buzzword now. And what does that really mean? And how do we identify what that is, I think, is a key trend right now. And how advising programs and advisors use the, the analytics or the data they have to make decisions is a key piece right now. Um, I think there's a, 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 um, a strong intentional partnership trend going on between universities and community colleges, much stronger than before. Um, Florida has been way ahead of that uh, for years in that, in that if you graduate from a community college in Florida, with a degree, you're guaranteed acceptance into one of the universities. That's been around forever within that. Um, but we just saw this morning in the news the the California University of California system has is developing 11 new tracks for community college students specifically as they transfer in. That's a major shift for entire systems to begin to think about that transfer population and how to open up the dialogue and open up the ease of transfer. And as advisors, that's going to be essential for us to know what those trends look like and to understand, you know, 
an articulation agreement doesn't mean that a student comes in with exactly every course you may have within your program, but how does that work at your campus? As well as the community college advisors in helping students understand why it's important to graduate in order to make transfer a much easier process within that. Um, and then I think also the idea of, of professional development I think is a, a key trend. How we need to be providing more professional development to advisors whatever area they may be in and it needs to be an ongoing professional development not something that happens once a year for two hours uh, during fall orientation but it's something that's continual and it's a process in which we talk continually about what our, our profession is and what the, the issues are in our profession. So I think that's a major trend that we're seeing a shift in as well in the advising field. Excellent. So I, it's certainly the influx of, of community college and transfer students I, I've heard be an issue for advisors or a challenge for advisors. What are some of the other challenges facing academic advisors today? You know, the one that's never going to change is going to be time that we have to do what we do and ratio on many of our campuses. And I shouldn't say never change. We, we do have some campuses who've made some significant impact in lowering the ratios on their campuses, but we still have a lot of campuses that the, the advisor-student ratio is extremely high. So I think that's going to continue to be a challenge. I think that's where we have to begin to, to really think about the next challenge, which is how do we utilize technology? How do we more effectively utilize systems that we have to enhance academic advising so that the things we might have used to have done, we now can have technology to work with to make that appointment with that student much more focused on the learner and not on the courses. So I think that's one of the big challenges. I think building collaborations across the campus is a, is a major challenge. Um, advisors, I, I say we're the best of both worlds. You know, we've got a foot in student affairs and a foot in academic affairs. And I think in that unique position, we are perfectly poised to, to be the, the um, hub of the wheel, as Wes Hamley used to say, but the idea of, of building those collaborations across the academic and the student affairs ranks and bring everyone together around the key issue, which is the student. You know, we get we get tied up in systems and models and sometimes forget that the students what we're here about. And I think that's a, a challenge within that. And then probably the last one is just the challenge that continues to, to um, I think, hit everybody on many campuses, but advisors specifically, and, and I think we're working on it to strengthen that is just the acceptance as, as a profession and a profession that's highly committed and dedicated and connected to the academic mission of the university. You know, all of student affairs, advising, everything that's not in the classroom is not outside the academic mission of the classroom. And we have to remember that we're all teachers and we all are part of the academic mission and therefore as a professional, what are our student learning outcomes? What's our curriculum and how are we going to assess that? So I think that's a challenge that advisors are facing today. How do we communicate that to our colleagues, to our faculty colleagues, to our student affairs colleagues, to our own colleagues? You know, we, we have some advisors who are perfectly comfortable with scheduling people all day long and, and punching on the computer. And we've got to get them out of that comfort zone into a zone of it's much more important to talk to the student about who they are and where they want to go do they take English on Tuesdays and Thursdays? You know, keep, keeping up with change has, has to be a, a challenge. I mean, I didn't go to school that long ago, and I recall, you know, standing in long lines with the uh, file index cards to, to gather my classes and, um, you know, calling by actually using a telephone to, to call and make an appointment. Who does that anymore, right? See, so I'm, older, I'm older than you are because I can remember when we, we did – telephone registration came into being, everybody panicked because they said nobody will ever come see an advisor again because they could do it from home on the telephone. And then when online registration came about, oh no, nobody will ever come in to see an advisor today because they could do it in their pajamas at home or the internet at 2 a.m. in the morning. And neither of those things happened. What occurred is the conversations with advisors became deeper 
because students could do those types of clerical bureaucratic things or by telephone or online and provide more opportunities for advisors and students to have those deeper conversations. But you're right, change is, is, is a, a huge issue that we're dealing with in higher education today. So I, again, on that same keynote address that I saw up on YouTube, and, and I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll have Laura tweet out that the link. Please don't watch it now. Please wait till the end of the show. <laughs> Um, in that same address, you talked about the challenge of organizational change. So what are the consequences of failing to change, and do you have any advice for those who prefer the way things have always been, who prefer the status quo? Uh, my advice to them is to hurry and retire or to move on because there is no status quo. Um, the, change is, the, the change that we're seeing in higher ed today is the, the largest change I think we've seen in the history of higher ed in our country. Uh, the, the closest to this was after World War II with the GI Bill and the creation of huge community colleges that came about because of that or the Morrell Act with the land grant institutions but we really are seeing a change even bigger than those and that is that we no longer can stay the status quo. That it's no longer about the organizational structure of the campus or about when faculty want to teach or when advisors want to have hours. It's about what do the students need to be successful within that and how do we make those changes. Um, higher ed is slow to change. You know, I, I always say it's easier to move a cemetery than it is a college. Dead people get up and walk faster than an academic senate will act on an issue. Uh, we get task force issues to death in higher education. And I think that the major factor that we're recognizing is if we want to survive, we've got to change, which means we've got to open up those lines of communication. Chancellors and presidents and provosts, you know, they're hearing the conversations at the top from, from Lumina, College Complete America, and, and all of these, the Gates Foundation, about pathways and the research and what's out there. The frontline advisors is that we're not always hearing that conversation. So how do we open that up? And that's a, a, a big change to have advisors and chancellors and provosts and deans sitting around a table together talking about what's best for students. But we've got to make that change if we're going to survive, particularly with the number of campuses and institutions that are now at least being partially funded by their graduation and persistence rates. Um, that totally changes how we even look at funding in higher education which is going to significantly impact higher education in the next decade. So the audience often asks the guests to, to really drill down and, and get into specifics. Can you identify a few areas or, or practices that advisors you think should let go of and maybe a few that we should never let go of, that we should absolutely hold on to? Absolutely. Um, the thing we should never let go of is the fact that we really have three major components that we work with that we have to know and deal with as we work with students. The first was informational. You know, students, they want to know we care, they want to know we're there, but they want to know we know stuff. And, you know, if we care, they'll let us slide about whether we absolutely know at that moment, but they do come to us expecting us to have the right information. So we can't we can never let go of that need to keep up to date on everything that's going on at the university or the, or the college because our students come to us expecting that. Uh, but also the conceptual piece. You know, what's the value of advising to student persistence to graduation? Uh, what's the connection between advising and student engagement or, or pathways to success? You know, what does the research tell us? What do we know about the foundational theories that, that ground us as advisors? We cannot lose sight of those conceptual pieces. And then the relational pieces. How do we build that relationship with students? And recognizing that that is key, but what we've got to let go of is that it can only happen face-to-face, one-to-one in our offices. You know, just like in the classroom today, faculty, and, and I teach every semester about, you know, we'll all be required to, to use different teaching strategies. We no longer stand up and lecture. You know, we use online, we use technology, we use group work, everything to get students to think for themselves. We have to do that in advising. We have to realize that 
the strategy or the, the, the challenge of working face to face with students is wonderful, but it's not always going to be the way that we can effectively reach all students. Many students, first and foremost, are reached through technology. And once you've reached out to them in that, in that way, whether it be through social media or through systems you have, they may be more likely to come in to see you at that point. And so I think the, the letting go of there's only one way to do advising is something we've got to let go of. Um, and then we've got to let go of the, the academic versus student affairs versus business affairs versus whomever affairs um, on our campuses and, re and really come together that we're a team. And as, and as a college, as a university, what do we do together to ensure that our students are successful? And we can no longer blame it on one side or the other. Because uh, we're all in this together, and I think we've got to let go of that. Not just advisors, but everybody in higher education has got to let go of that blame game that we played for years. Yeah, break, break, breaking down the silos seems to be a, a common theme uh, over the last few years, a required theme. So, so we, we're getting plenty of questions both by email and through Twitter, and, and Jody Owen from South Dakota State University would like you to talk a little bit about predictive modeling. So for those unfamiliar, could you explain predictive modeling and early alert systems for at-risk students and maybe identify a few schools or programs that are doing this well? I'll be glad to. Um, Jody, I look forward to we'll be on your campus in October. So I'm looking forward to being there. I've never been on your campus, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, I, I think we all know that analytics is the buzzword today. and and it's, it's really not a whole lot different than, than data or evidence or whatever we want to call it. It's, it's pulling the information about the students that we know about them from all the different areas on campus and bringing it together. In the past, we've had information in the registrar's office. We've had information in financial aid. We have information in career development, information in academic advising. But we never brought all of that together into a big picture of what we know about the students in order for us all to work together. So it's really using whatever systems we have to bring all of that data together to make decisions that are positive and affect the academic advice experience of students within that. Um, you know, it really doesn't matter what system you use. I don't care what your data system is. The key is how do you use it? And that's the real issue. You know, it doesn't matter if you buy blank or blank or A or B or C. What do you do with it once you have it? And you know, there's a lot of campuses that have data just coming out their ears that they never ever ever use, and they think they don't. They don't even know it exists on campuses. So you even open up the dialogue between advisors and institutional planning and research to say, you know, what does exist? What do we know about our students? because we don't always have that information. Uh, there's a couple of campuses in the past couple of years who've gotten a lot of, of, of global notice for some work they're doing. Um, Georgia State University in Atlanta has gotten a lot of, of airplay on some of the work they've been doing on bringing together advising of, of particularly first year students in a centralized way to focus on. Florida International University is a university that's gotten a lot of airplay in the past few years looking specifically at what do we know about our students, what do we need in order to better work with them and their institution that went out on a limb about three or four years ago and, and, and took funding and focused on advising and hired 50 new advisors to work on campus and all the different variety of colleges and divisions. So uh, those are just two that are doing some great things. There's also um, the Alamo Community College District in San Antonio. They're doing some great work as a district, bringing all five or six of their colleges together and really talking about what do we as a, as a community college district need to do for students, not what does Palo Alto need to do or San Antonio or, or Northwest Vista or whatever it is, but as a, as a district, what do we do? So they're doing some really good work um, in that district as well. So those are just three I've left out thousands and so 
but you forced me to come up with a couple or three to say, so I blame it on you for all the ones I left out. So maybe the audience can can help us out here. I'm watching a huge viewership right now on the live broadcast, and Laura Pasquini tells me that there's lots of people uh, having conversations on the back channel on Twitter. So if folks know about some some not you you don't know, like the the word best practices or some good practices uh, that are out there, please share them um, using the higher ed live hashtag uh, so that people can can check them out after the show. Now, one of the, one of the things, Tony, I just want to say quickly, one of the things I think we're seeing a lot of institutions, and it's really exciting, is the whole idea that that academic advising is a profession, so therefore we have to be involved with the research and know what's happening, so that in advising units and staff meetings, part of staff meetings now are actually built around articles, new research in the field, not talking about the new courses or the new financial aid policies or what banner screens or people soft screens we're going to use. First, we're going to focus on our profession, then we'll talk about those areas. It's changing the whole culture of advising in higher education when we see that happening on, happening on campuses, and it, it's just exciting to see that occurring. So I'm going to get into that research question in just a minute, but part of the question that Jody Owen from South Dakota State University asked about was in regards to ethics. So there is so much big data out there now, not just academic data, but, but how many times a student eats, their social media usage, how often they exercise, how many times they visit the library, uh, how many student organizations they're involved in, um, certainly have benefits to, to potentially inform advising strategy, but can you, can you speak for a moment about the potential ethical dilemma there? Well, first I have to say, the more we know, the better job we can do. And that's the first piece we have to think about. The key becomes, let's identify up front what we need to know, why we need to know, and that's why we gather it. So if we're not going to use the information about how many times students use the, the fitness center, why do we care about that? And why are we pulling that? If we're not going to use the way students interact with social media and decisions we make about student success initiatives, then why are we gathering that? So I think the ethical piece comes in the upfront piece. You know, what is it we as a university need to know to provide the best student success experiences for our students, identifying those and gathering that data and then using it within that. Um, you know, there's always the, the ethical issue of, of what a, a campus needs that doesn't need to know about students and whether it's FERPA and, or right to know or whatever the case may be. Um, I, I think I err on the side of the student and that is that the, the more we know, the better we can help the students to be successful um, and I go back to we define what it is we need to know, focus on that and let the other stuff go. Um, if we're not going to use it while we gather it, you know, I, I, I really get very upset with campuses that survey students to death and never use the results of those surveys. Um, it looks good on paper, I could use it in an assessment portfolio, I could use it for a uh, accreditation visit but I've just asked students to spend time responding to a survey that I never planned to use as I work with students. And we've got to break away from that. So to me, that's the ethical issue is what are we asking, why are we asking it, and how are we going to use it? Excellent. I, I brought it up because Ray Jun I did a show with Ray Junko, who's done a lot of research in this area over the last few years, and, and he brought up this concept of trace analytics and, and potentially maybe you determine that a student who goes to the library twice a week and has three square meals and works out twice a week will do better over the course of their term. So you might make recommendations for, you know, outside of the classroom. Uh, but, but to your point, we need to be intentional about using that data for sure. Absolutely. And we need to be intentional about how we're using it both inside and outside the classroom and, and do it as a team so that the faculty are using that data as they work with students inside the classroom, advisors are using it as they advise students, 
housing directors and, and hall monitors are using it as they work with, with students in residential life. I'm sorry, I always get in trouble with our graduate students when I go back to the old world of housing. It took me a while to get past dorms, so I think I'm doing pretty good. Uh, but the idea that, that we all use that as a team for students as we work forward. So not just outside, but also inside working together with the classroom and the academics. So that brings us to a Twitter question from Pat Kate. And Pat asks, what are some of the best ways you think advising can best engage with student affairs staff, not that academic advisors couldn't be student affairs staff, uh, but specifically like res life and student activities? Oh, I, I think there's so many ways that it's just um, astounding. Obviously, one of the best connections is between academic advising experience and the residential life experiences of students. Uh, when students live on campus in residential housing and, and have a residential life experience, we are missing the boat if we don't bring academic advising into that experience by collaborating with the residence life folks, whether it be having advising time specifically in certain residence halls or certain nights or certain times, whether we do cross-training between residence life and academic advisors on issues that, that they need to be aware of, um, whether we look at the student activities directors and, and talk about you know, how can we better utilize what you're doing to engage students and as advisors talk to the students about the importance of engagement and here are a whole array of student activities that are being sponsored by the student affairs area, let's go through and decide which ones of these really would benefit you and why, and then talk about how you could get involved with those. So I think really combining those talents that we all bring to the table is something that we've got to do a better job of. Uh, but we also need to do it between just advisors. If I'm an advisor of the College of Education at Kansas State and an advisor of the Business College at Kansas State, how about how about partnering and working with those advisors in those two units? So it, it's partnering with everyone on campus and, and getting away from where you report and who you are and, and let's talk about the students within that. I love it. I love it. So, so you mentioned before the importance of bringing research into our conversations and our dialogue and, and helping tell the, the story of the, of the importance of advising. And Tim Fricker from Mohawk College in Ontario, Canada wants to know what's some of the important re recent research findings about the effect of advising, or, or more generally, what is some of the more important or some of the interesting research that's currently going on in this area? Thank you. Um, and, and thank you for that question from Canada, because we, the Canada is very much a global association, so we, we just got back from our second international conference that was held in Melbourne, Australia had 330 something folks from 19 countries so it's exciting to have a question from Canada. Um, I, the, the thing we need to recognize is student success and persistence to graduation is never going to be based on one thing. There's not a magic bullet. And so what we do know in the research is the more engaged students are, the more likely they are to be successful and the more they understand their pathway or where they're moving toward to get a degree and what they're going to do with it, the more likely they are to be successful. So there's some really powerful research coming out of lots of places. Portland State, for one. I've had several colleagues who've done the dissertation on some really good work that was done at the University of, in, in Oregon with a collaborative between the universities and community, community colleges there. Um, what, there's some great research coming out of the UK um, and what they're looking at, United Kingdom, as far as the connection between personal tutoring, as they call it, and the academic realm and bringing folks together. So I think recognizing that the research is more based on how strong advising is to get each students engaged with their education and engaged with their college experiences. And we're seeing some, some good quality research coming out in the Dakota Journal about that, as well as some good action research 
occurring and being published all over in the, in the academic advising mentor at Penn State, in the academic advising today through NACADA, in ACPA publications, in NASPA publications. The, the great thing is there's very little you can do research on in student success and not tap advising in some way because of how in, how much it brings together all pieces of the student's experience. Excellent. So we, we got another question from Andy Howe from St. Paul, Minnesota. He, he's part of a higher ed consulting group. And he says in an online environment, what what is or will be the future role of advisors? I mean, the growth of distance education has really changed, right? The, the need to increase the need for distance advising. What are some of the benefits and challenges of remotely connecting? And how do you build rapport through a phone or a computer? I wasn't going to bring my Sonic cup up to advertise until I saw you bring your grape bottle up, so I figured it was my, safe to do my that. My vitamin water. I, yeah, yeah, exactly. I should, I should get money um, for that. Yeah. Um, Andy brings up a good point, and, and Andy's a colleague here at Kansas State who teaches, and I, we have an online master's program in academic advising, and it's one of the, the largest graduate programs at Kansas State, and we're in our sixth or seventh year of that program. Students are totally at a distance in a graduate program. So we're dealing with that here as faculty members and advisors. How do we enhance the relationship with students who may be in the Middle East, who may be in Europe, who may be in Africa, who are in, a, in our program? And we see that with all, all online um, aspects. I think one of the pieces that we first have got to talk about is how are we going to, as a university, use technology to engage students in all ways. Then begin to talk about how to use that in the online environment. Uh, they, they're not separate between how we do the two. Uh, the key really becomes in the online environment is there's a lot more work we have to do as advisors and student affairs professionals and faculty in engaging students with each other in that online environment and with us in that online environment. You know, I, I say all the time, it, I, I work a whole lot harder when I teach my online courses than I do with my on-campus courses because of just the, the bringing together the, the students in a virtual community of scholars to have that type of high-level conversation online. And we need to do the same thing with advising. Uh, it's very easy to let online advising only be about which courses I need to take next instead of having the same type of online conversation either through social media, through podcasts, through webcasts that reach multitudes of students as well as one-on-one -on -one conversations with students online um, at the same time. So it's, it's looking at how we can utilize technology campus-wide but then how do we bring that into the online environment? It's going to be truly, I think, the, the um, next major challenge uh, that we're going to see. You know, we, 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 we've gone through the, the, the challenges of at-risk students and unprepared students and, and bringing together campuses. And, and I think that the distance education realm is going to be something that we're all going to be focused on a great deal of learning from each other about over the next decade and, and how we reach out to students more than we than we do now. You know, it, it really uh, it has a potential to increase reach and, and non-traditional students and, and certainly scale. And, I, you know, I, I recognize that I don't really have a full understanding of what a typical ratio or, or, or good ideal um, advisor to student ratio might be. I'd be interested to see if folks could tweet out what what their ratio is for their schools to, to do some comparisons. And then if you yeah. go on if you go on the Dakota website, there's the 2011 Academic Advising Survey results there. There's an article by Rich Robbins about ratio and what we found out in that survey uh, from self-reported data from institutions on that. So I encourage people to Excellent. go and, and find that survey and look at that article by Rich. Excellent. Thank you. 
So I, I want to take a left turn for a minute and, and talk about customer service. I mean, it, customer service has been a big topic in lots of areas of student affairs right now. And I, looking back, I, I can't exactly say that I had view, viewed my academic advisors during my undergraduate experience as customer service experts. How does the advising community regard the issue of students as customers? I think we have to, to look at the idea of assessment, and that's what we really go back to, and that is the fact that traditionally advising has been measured in two ways. One's been the bean counting, you know, how many advisees do you have? You know, you saw 9,000 advisors, advisees this morning, Tony, so you must be an excellent advisor. You know, it doesn't mean they learned anything. It doesn't mean they know anything more than they knew before, but you saw them. So we counted that, and then the other was student satisfaction. You know, was the student satisfied with what they got? Well, unfortunately, many times advisors are the bearer of bad news. You know, they're the ones who have to have that conversation with students about, you know, you're never going to get into med school, or you're not going to get into our nursing program. What's a plan B or C? Because students don't want to think of a plan B or C. So when we have to have those hard conversations, it would be easy to say we're providing poor customer service because students don't leave happy within that. Um, so I think we have to think about customer service in terms of what we're delivering to students. Are we delivering the, the experiences to students that they expect and that we know are best for them? And are we delivering those in ways that meet all the variety of ways that students connect with our university or colleges? That's where the real customer service comes in. Uh, within that, uh, I, I worked at a community college for 20 years, and you know we used the word customer forever at, at that at that college, and there was all sorts of arguments about whether our students were customers or not, and you know we can argue about that all day long. The real bottom line is, are we providing students with what they need to be successful? And if we are, then we're meeting them where they are, and we're getting them to where they need to be. And that's good customer service. Cool. So sometimes I'll just babble, Tony, and tell them no, you, no, act no. Like you know what I'm saying. No. <laughs> I'm I'm multitasking, Charlie. I'm, I'm trying to keep I'm trying to keep up with Laura on the back channel here and and listen in at the same time. So speaking of Laura, let let's talk for a moment about social media. Um, what what do, do academic advisors, should they be engaged in social media? Um, how should they be engaged? Like, what, what's the current, current recommendation for advisors? Uh, once again, you've got to look at how we're going to use social media as an institution. Advisors shouldn't be using it any differently than anyone else on campus within that. Uh, we might use it to deliver different messages. You know, I might deliver a different message on Facebook that I do on Twitter that the faculty member may as they're making those contact, contacts through social media. Uh, we, can't, we can't ignore social media. I mean, we simply can't. And so the question becomes, what are we using it for? How, what information are we delivering? Which social media platform might be the best for delivering specific types of information or types of services to students? Um, and then recognizing that by the time we figured it out, the students are way past us onto something else that we have no idea what it is. Um, you know, I, I just now figured out Twitter, and now Lauren tells me I should forget that and go to something else. So, um, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the old guys. Um, but the social media isn't going to change. It's going to become more important. There's just going to be more variety in what it looks like. And how we utilize it has got to become a key part of our curriculum building in academic advising, as well as in the classroom, as well as in student affairs. How do we build our curriculum utilizing the social media platforms that we may have? So I've asked her on, the, on my little side uh, page what channel you should be using. So we'll, so we'll see if she answers that for us. <laughs> I'm thinking Snapchat, uh, not Tinder. I know it's not Tinder. Um, I hope not. No, just kidding. <laughs> so, 
So I want to get into the topic. I got a few questions emailed on, about special populations. And maybe we can start off by having you share some specific strategies when it comes to dealing with first-gen students. Uh, I was real excited that you asked this question, Tony. And, and I wanted noted that I didn't tell you to ask it. Uh, but we've been very involved here at Kansas State with the whole idea of first-generation students. Uh, we're a research, one university, we're a land-grant university, uh, but 34 percent of our undergraduates in our College of Education are first-generation students. That's a huge number. Forty percent of the entire student undergraduate population at Kansas State are first-gen students. That's a huge population. And, and so I think even though we look at a national figure that says about 19 to 20 percent are first gens, we know there are universities and particular community colleges that have high numbers. Um, we, the College of Education here under the leadership of Dean Mercer uh, put together a wonderful documentary that's entitled Walk in My Shoes that's available on the Nakata website that many institutions are using as part of their advisor development on working with first-gen students. I think the key, what the, the, the very first thing with the first-generation students is recognizing they don't know our language. And we tend to use higher education jargon with them and they have no idea what we're talking about. But they're too embarrassed or scared to tell us that they don't know that. Uh, when this documentary got out on, on YouTube, Michelle Obama picked it up and wrote about it in one of her, in a couple of her blogs for the White House and talked about her being a first generation student and taking the wrong size sheets to her university for her dorm room when she was a freshman and being embarrassed because she didn't know they were the wrong size sheets because no one knew to tell her what to bring. Um, so it's that, how do we have those conversations with students who don't know our language, I think is key with the first generation population. If we can do that first, we then can open up the dialogue with all the other issues. Um, but our curriculum has got to begin there with them. Um, I think with all populations, that's really where we begin. You know, if you're talking about a biology course, Every biology program begins with the foundation of language. And what's the common vocabulary we've got to know, the common foundation of knowledge. And so whether we're talking about underprepared students or first gens or students with disabilities, we are all talking about what's that, that what's that foundational language we all need to have. And then from there, what are the specific things I need to know about adult learners? Or what are the specific things I need to know about underprepared students? You know, I think one of the things in the next decade that's going to be exciting for advisors is I think we're going to see the advisors becoming specialized in areas so that instead of being thought of as just as generalists, we're going to see advisors who are experts in adult learners or experts in, in distance learning advising or experts in underprepared and they actually are hired or they actually go out and, and look for positions based upon that expertise. That's going to be so exciting to see that occur. And and it's going to be just increasing dramatically the professional development opportunities for advisors, but then also the whole career development for advisors. Uh, you know, presently there are very few career ladders out there for advisors. You come in and except for the, the basic pay grade changes when you've lasted five years or ten years, you don't see a whole lot of growth opportunities. And I think we're going to see with specialization and more professional development, the opportunities for advisors to grow on a career ladder that recognizes research, recognizes presentations, recognizes publications um, within that, but also looks at what is what, what have I learned about specific population that make me eligible to move to that next level and work with students or advisors in that area. You brought up career development, and it reminded me where I mean, there is where is the handoff? Where is the line between academic advisors and career services professionals? And is there an opportunity for those to hybridize at some point? Is Absolutely. that happening anywhere? Absolutely. Um, if you go to the Nakata website, there's a there's a whole page of institutions who have integrated career and academic advising. 
um, and the programs that they have on their campuses with links to their programs um, and people you can contact at those institutions. Um, Rowan University in, in New Jersey many years ago, and Betsy McCullough Wiggins, a former Dakota president, integrated academic and career advising together at least 15 years ago, I believe now. Um, so we, we've seen this as a movement, um, and I think what we're recognizing is we don't have to integrate the offices. We can integrate the professional development between those two areas. It may be for students it's best if I bring the two services together into one location, but it may be best for the students that advisor to career development folks are working together on what they need to know to both help the students as they follow that pathway within that. But there's, there is that line is so blurred between career development and, and academic advisors that I personally hope it continues to get blurred and we continue to, to collaborate and work together towards student success in their persistence and what they're moving toward. You know, none of us, unless we're faculty, are doing exactly today what our undergraduate degree was in. And so as we're working with students, we need to understand what the new career markets is going to look like in 10 years. So we need that expertise of career advisors to help us identify that as we're working with students. Excellent. So what, two more questions because we're running low on time here. I want to briefly talk for a moment about equity and advising. You know, specialty groups are not always the ones that you need it most often receive a disproportionate amount of resources and attention. What role do advisors have in advocating for issues of social justice and equity? Um, you know, I think that goes back to the, the question of analytics, is how do we use analytics to determine who we need to, to target or who we need to work with. Um, we've gone through the, the term of, you know, we're going we're gonna to target underprepared students who might also be student athletes, who might also be um, students with disabilities, who might also be a GLBT student. So that student is contacted by 12 offices a day. And so by the end of the day, they're like, don't send me another email ever. And then you've got the student who never hears from a soul. And so I think advisors have a, a big role to play in that, that conversation of social justice and how we look at the, the issue of it's not treating people equally, it's treating people equitably. And how do we bring that concept into the advising experiences of students so that students understand that, that we don't expect them all to be the same. And we're going to work with them where they are, but we're going to be equitable in how we do that. And I think the conversations around social justice are so important for advisors to be involved with. And that's a perfect collaboration between the student affairs and academic uh, affairs or advising areas to have that conversation because student affairs have been discussing social justice for decades and and we need to look at that expertise from student affairs to help us figure out how to utilize that in other areas on campuses. I'm going to guess that your tweet about there will be a tweet that will be retweeted 20 times about uh, not treating them equally but equitably. Okay. That's my prediction. Okay. <laughs> so, so final question: What advice do you have for young professionals entering the field? You know, Tony, the first thing I have to tell you that's so exciting is is we're seeing more young professionals come into the advising field because they chose it. You know, I'm I'm of the generation I fell into academic advising. You know, I was an English faculty member, got hired to teach at a community college, and because I was a faculty member, I had to advise. They had no idea what it was. Uh, many advisors who are professional advisors will tell you they fell into it. You know, they started at university and someone said, you know, you know a lot about everything. Why don't you come work in the advising center? And that's how they got there. Where we're now seeing young professionals coming into the field of advising because they chose that field. And that to me is so exciting. And I think as we see that grow, we're going to see the profession continue to expand in research and in publications and in its importance on campuses. Uh, my advice 
to the other officials coming in is that they have an obligation both ethically and morally to be a part of the field of study that they're a professional in. That they have to be involved in the research. They have an ethical responsibility to share that, that research and share those publications across campus and to bring out the conversations that are being had in the advising profession to our faculty members in the sociology department or engineering school or whatever the case may be, that that's going to be an obligation that they have to understand as part of what will make them professionals. Um, and then last, that, that they need to quickly learn how to get up out of their offices and get across campus and go visit other offices and meet people. You can't build partnerships if you never leave your office. And so we've got to get out of our offices and go meet people and talk to people. And, and we can get out of our offices through social media, through technology. Uh, but we can also get out of our offices by getting out of our offices within that. But as new professionals coming in, that's essential that, that we build those partnerships early and quickly um, as we work through that. That's great advice for all higher education professionals, for sure. So, so Charlie, in the, in the last minute, is there is there anything that we didn't get to or didn't cover that that you want to share before we we close up here? You know, Tony, I think I think we probably have hit it all. I I um, I think the major piece that I would like your audience to leave with is that it doesn't matter what our title is or where we report. We're all part of the academic mission of our institutions. We're all teachers and students are learning from every one of us every day in our work with them. And that we have to continue to communicate that we're all part of the academic mission of a campus. You know, as we look at financial crisis and what occurred in the last decade, what's going to continue to occur, those things that are thought of outside the academic mission are going to be the easy things to cut or the easy things to say we don't need. And we need to be very clear that we're, we are part of the academic mission of our universities and our colleges and identify our curriculums, our learning outcomes, and identify how we're assessing those and how we're using that assessment to make changes that will impact the experiences of students coming in next year within it. So be a part of the profession knowing your curriculum, building learning outcomes, and assessing how students are achieving those. If, if nothing else, I hope your audience slept with those ideas in mind. Well, Charlie, you were a great teacher for me. I, I self-admittedly didn't know a whole lot of this area, so I appreciate your, uh, your great metaphors and stories and explanations. Uh, I certainly learned a lot through, through today's show. Um, by the viewership, it's, it seems like you are a, you are a big hit, and, and hopefully people will share this out uh, to help other educate others in the field. Also, want to thank Laura Pasquini for monitoring our back channel today. I can't wait to see what damage she did back there. I can't. Uh, I, I have to thank Laura as well because Laura has has kept me out of trouble and got me into trouble over technology over the years. So thank you, Laura. <laughs> So I'll be returning in August with another great show on student veteran issues. I'll also be doing a show on hot trends in housing. And be sure to tune into Heather Shea Gasser on July 29th as she hosts a show on student activism with Chris Linder, Stephen John Quay, and Steve Sutton. Please find me on Twitter for more information and details of upcoming shows. Until then, my name is Tony Duty. Make it a great week, and thanks for tuning in. Bye, everyone.